Well, thanks again for joining us today, everybody, for our UN Science Talk webinar series, where we're specifically focusing on key findings of research projects with an emphasis on the implications of results and pragmatic recommendations for stakeholders and practitioners. We're continuing with Research Thrust A today with a presentation from Dr. Forrest Meggers at Princeton University. Please be sure to tune in next week for our final presentation in the Thrust A series that will explore the biodiversity in um, urban water sustainability. And that'll be presented by Dr. Darrow Jenneret uh, coming out of University of California, Riverside. As you guys all know at this point, we are recording these webinars and we'll post them to our YouTube channel and UN websites. And I'll be sure to send out that information once I get things loaded to YouTube. Uh, everyone should be muted as they enter the webinar. Please feel free to enter your questions in the chat queue, um, or you can unmute yourself at the end of Dr. Megger's presentation, and we can facilitate a nice little discussion for those of us joining today. So with that, I am excited to introduce Dr. Forrest Meggers, Associate Professor of Architecture and Director of the Chaos Lab at Princeton University. In 2013, Dr. Meggers came to Princeton, jointly appointed to the School of Architecture and the new Andlinger Center for Energy and Environment. He founded and directs the Cooling and Heating for Architecturally Optimized Systems, aka Chaos Lab, where he and his research team investigate alternative thermal paradigms to engage architecture and maximize performance. Forrest has several patents and founded the spin-off Earth Labs to develop his smart sensor technology to improve thermostats. His fields of knowledge include building systems design and integration, sustainable systems, renewable energy, radiant systems, desiccants, exergy analysis, geothermal, seasonal energy storage, building materials, thermodynamics, and heat transfer and heat pumps. So with that, Forrest, I'm going to hand the steering wheel over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, it's been really fun. I am unbelievably indebted to the wonderful team of UN researchers, all faculty, postdocs, undergrads, master students that have uh, been so engaging and willing to discuss such a wide variety of topics that are critical to our urban water infrastructure and energy systems. And today I'm going to dive a little bit into um, the area of energy water overlaps, referred to often as the energy water nexus. Um, and I'm going to focus this time. I did a webinar before that was also the energy water urban nexus. I should have called this one the urban energy water nexus, maybe. Um, let me get the right screen shared here. Where did it go? Sorry. Plug in. Bear with my, uh, apparently my, my computer didn't get promoted yet. So it's still being a little slow. <laughs> it's loading. Um. Okay. I see your, your Zoom uh, screen at the moment. Yeah. There. There we go. Perfect. Looking good. You're Great. ready to rock and roll. Um, I didn't even change my title accidentally. See, I'm not. Um, so, so yeah, as I was saying, um, uh, I will focus on the urban water urban nexus and as already pointed out, um, it will be a dynamic presentation because I am the self-appointed director of chaos, um, which is a source of my own, my own team and, uh, provided a little dash of that into the UN network. Um, but more importantly, uh, following up on conversations with Matt Jojescu um, around football, it's important to point out that the Chaos Lab origins are in Iowa and all those little girls know the Iowa fight song and we'll be singing it a lot this weekend. Um, so it's always good to have a cordial uh, uh, exchange at UN amongst all the people from around the country, um, especially Matt around football. But we're not gonna talk about football today, um, but I am gonna start with a little fun theme maybe related since uh, I was referring to the fight song, um, which is the fight club. So we're going to talk about the energy water fight club first, um, mainly because I like using this um, sort of critical argument that we don't talk enough about energy and water um, overlaps. Usually there's like people way over here talking about water, water quality, uh, uh, water and ecology, water systems. Um, and then those are the, all my 
colleagues that run power plants and study energy and do thermodynamics. Um, but those two things have so many overlaps and a lot of people are doing research um, at the interface of energy and water. And I'm just gonna frame it very briefly. And then um, uh, to give us a sense of what that space is, the fight club in between energy and water, um, because it is a good analogy for being a fight club because um, like the Iowa Hawkeyes, it is very big and strong, the difference in energy when we move water around and when we change phases of water. And so um, I'll give that overview. And then uh, I have talked about some of these projects, I think in the previous webinar, I'm just gonna give an overview because I am so appreciative of all the students um, that have worked with me over the past uh, uh, five, six years on, on these projects related to um, urban water and energy. But then I'm gonna uh, dive into um, my favorite area uh, of urban surfaces. And we definitely don't talk about this part because mainly um, a lot of the heat that relates to surfaces and how water evaporates and exchanges with surfaces in our built environment um, happens in the infrared spectrum we don't see. And so I do a lot of fun things playing around with ways to make that both visible, interpretable, and quantifiable. Um, and so we'll talk about how that relates eventually then to some um, important aspects of blue and green surfaces being deployed, which we've heard about in previous weeks, the importance of understanding how the urban scale um, infrastructure like parks and streams and bioswales play roles in our um, uh, uh, relationship with heat and heat in the, in the urban environment. Um, all right, so the Energy Water Fight Club, what is it? Well, most people here um, that travel around talking about water and energy uh, don't spend a lot of time standing in a place like this, though this is a view that you get taking the Amtrak from New York City up to Boston on your way out of New York, and this is a wastewater treatment plant um, down here on the left. I always forget whether mouse is visible, right? If I move the mouse, I think people uh, generally can see it. I have to make the pointer thing. Yeah, usually you can see that. I can see your mouse, but it's kind of yep. small. Great. So I'll use the mouse a little bit on the screen, point out some of the things here. But um, you have a power plant, right? And a wastewater treatment plant. Um, and again, like water is the critical thing over here at the wastewater treatment plant. Energy is the critical thing over there at the power plant, but the power plant's using a lot of water as part of the infrastructure that allows it to make power. And the wastewater treatment plant is using a lot of power to do things it needs to do to clean up the wastewater. Um, and in and of itself also making biogas over here in the left, which is itself a potential fuel for powering some of these systems. So there's a lot of different ways we can think about how energy um, goes into these water systems down here at the bottom or how water goes into energy systems. And that's kind of the classic uh, energy, energy water nexus. But even out here in the distance, throughout the city, every building has its own interrelationship with water and energy. And every surface of every plant that's in every park in the city is actually also playing a critical role um, in the mitigation and the uh, management um, depending on how our urban planners deploy things like parks, um, all those surfaces in the city are also at the interface of uh, energy and water. And it is um, through a very simple piece of physics, which is, as I will claim, the only energy water rules you need to know. Um, and you don't need to memorize this number. This is just to say that quite simply, all those things that are happening in the stomata of leaves, at the surface of bricks being rained on, in the evaporative towers of a power plant, or in the pumps of a wastewater treatment plant, have this relationship that water, when you heat it up or down by one Kelvin or one Celsius, right, uh, changes its energy content by 4.2 kilojoules for every kilogram of water you have. So kilograms a liter, right, of water. So you take your one liter bottle, if you heat it up by a degree, you got 4.2 more kilojoules of energy in there. Um, and that relationship is absolutely fundamental to all the heat exchangers that are passing water through them in any of our power plants or wastewater treatment plants. And then the other one that maybe I 
would argue should get appreciated a little more because it's a much bigger number is when we take water and evaporate it, we get this other really big number of 2000 kilojoules for every kilogram of water I evaporate. And that's what you see every day happening in, in uh, evaporative cooling towers or more commonly uh, on your face. So we have all these heating and cooling systems that depend on moving water and changing its temperature, but the interface of water and air has this huge um, potential energy impact, right? So we've had uh, researchers down at ASU looking at misters and what the role of changing humidity, because when I evaporate that water into the air in front of this fan, um, it gets significantly cooler. Um, and your body knows this, and it's the only reason you can survive in a sauna. If you enjoy saunas, you know that you can get the temperature up to 160, 70 degrees, and you don't instantly die because your body starts sweating and evaporating water off you very quickly. And then most importantly, what we'll come to hopefully um, by the end of the day is understanding how the relationship of the surface of a leaf, not necessarily the sort of beauty that we often see of actual droplets of water that are hydrophobic kind of balanced on a leaf, but the fact that under those droplets, droplets are stomata and that leaves are constantly full of water and are doing what the fan is doing at the top of this image and evaporating water in the atmosphere, thereby mitigating a lot of sensible urban heat um, that you would otherwise experience if not surrounded by plants. So this is the backdrop I'd like to set up. Um, there's one technical thing about this, uh, this piece of uh, water to vapor transport on the right that I always feel obligated to show, although it is the bane of the existence of many of the architects that I teach. Um, and this is the psychrometric chart, which is a way to map how humidity changes in the air as different amounts of water vapor move around. Um, and it's important because if I have very dry air, so these red lines represent the relative humidity that you hear the meteorologist telling you every day, oh, tomorrow it's gonna be humid, it'll be like 80% relative humidity. Or if you're out in Colorado, Arizona, and say, oh, you get your hand lotion out, the humidity is dropping to like below 20%, right? Um, so this is what we report often in the weather. Also for building scientists, we use this to, to describe comfort. Um, but what this maps to is some physical quantities that are important for engineered systems, like how much, how many grams of water are actually in the air on the right-hand side here, and what is the temperature of the air. So as the temperature of the air goes down, the number of grams that can fit in the air is less. And so the mental image I like to give people when thinking about the dynamics of water vapor in the air is that when air gets warmer, it's like a sponge getting bigger. Or otherwise you can think of it as like, if you have a glass half full and then you make the glass bigger and now the glass is a quarter full. And so relative humidity is exactly that phenomenon that as you make a glass bigger, you get less fullness of the glass. And likewise, as I make air warmer, you get less fullness of the air, quote unquote. And so for that reason, as I warm up the air um, and I keep the same amount of water in it, so this number on the right, I'm gonna hold this constant. If I just heat the air up from 15 degrees to 30 degrees um, on this line, you can see that I cross over a lot of the relative humidity lines. And um, that's why in the winter, people often talk about it, it being dry, when in reality, outside in the winter, the relative humidity can be quite high um, if it's snowing, but inside your house, if it's snowing and zero degrees down here, um, if I heat the air up to a comfortable temperature of 20 degrees, I'm only at about 20% to 30% humidity. Um, and so it's that those processes that are at play that are changing um, our indoor environment. And likewise, um, in the outdoor environment, understanding how as air temperatures rise during the day, relative humidities change, um, and understanding how if I evaporate water into the air, um, I can use this chart to understand how by releasing water into the air, I move along these black lines that we haven't discussed yet, but these are important for evaporation. These are the lines that if I don't heat or cool the air, but I just let it evaporate into the air. So if I start down here in Arizona over at 40 degrees and like 20% humidity, if I just release water vapor into the air and don't add or remove heat to it, I magically get to move up this black line, which is a constant enthalpy or constant energy line. And I can cool the air down to 20 degrees just by increasing its humidity 
up to 100%. Now, arguably, we don't always want 100% humidity, but you can see that there's a, a big potential for evaporative cooling when the air is dry. Sadly, here in New Jersey um, and in Singapore, places where we do a lot of research, um, we don't have the opportunity to do a lot of evaporative cooling, um, but there is huge opportunities, um, thinking of new technologies that you know, manipulate humidity in the air. Um, and having a little sense that this chart exists is important um, because one thing a lot of people don't realize is although um, our friend Willis Kep Carrier invented the air conditioner at the turn of the century in 1902, the more important thing he invented was actually this chart. So none of these machines uh, could in be invented without having known something about how we manipulate humidity and temperature um, using air conditioning machines. So now I'm just gonna try, this will probably be a little fast because um, I wanna get to some of the newer stuff, but I just would love to point out a few of the things that we've done um, that are, are relevant to energy um, and water systems in the city particularly. So um, at the very beginning, we did this paper um, with a couple postdocs and um, some of my students that went on to complete their PhD um, uh, during the, the UN program timeframe, as well as a, an architecture student. Um, and we looked at all the air conditioning systems and their relationship to that outdoor environmental conditions, as well as to the surface conditions that they're connected to. Because obviously stacking a lot of air conditioners right next to each other means that when this air conditioner tries to push it, it's heat out. It's got to deal with all the heat from the other air conditioners that are pushing heat around, around, out around them, as well as deal with all the radiant heat trans, trans the radiant heat coming down from the sky that might be getting trapped in this urban canyon over here um, that Ellie and Matt have modeled, as well as um, surface effects from rain and moisture that might be hitting the surfaces. Um, so we looked at uh, aspects of how temperature impacts the performance of these units, because as the temperature goes up around them, as the surfaces are heated up around them, their performance goes down and this connection to the urban heat effect and the sort of feedback on air conditioners hadn't directly been analyzed. So there's this factor of performance called the coefficient of performance that we can, that has a physical relationship to the temperature in which all these air conditioning units are sitting. And so we did analysis showing if we mitigate higher temperatures um, through different strategies on buildings, either through changing rooftop conditions to addressing the background urban heat island um, overall, uh, to ways in which we install window air conditioners not right on top of each other. And we basically just showed how much energy savings we could have um, by using alternative technologies. For example, using evaporative cooling instead of just rejecting heat like in these inexpensive systems where we just reject heat out into the dry air. And we showed that we could have a significant amount of energy savings um, uh, by thinking about holistically about the relationship of the uh, urban environment and the uh, urban climate um, to the performance of our, of our air conditioners. So we could uh, save about 20% uh, of the energy um, that would otherwise be needed to drive that cooling um, just by addressing uh, urban heat impacts. Um, the other one, another project that we, we worked on uh, in collaboration um, uh, um, with two of the ERP students, the urban the undergraduate research program students, was looking at the energy, again, in the water system. So understanding that um, hot water heating, um, as we make buildings, this, this chart, this bar, um, stack chart and pie chart on the left is showing how a typical building space heating is the largest demand, but as, as we move to low energy buildings, um, we haven't addressed hot water nearly as much as we could. And there's a huge opportunity to look at the potential of all these temperatures in our wastewater system and how if we can capture and recover them, there's a huge potential for energy savings. So these students did some wonderful analysis looking at different modalities of recovering heat in this system. Um, and looked at the capacity potentially, how much, how many kilowatt hours of heat could we recover under various scenarios. Um, and this was a really fun project. And I think also an example of where we generated a resource that um, maybe didn't provide a, a new technical solution, but really helped to expose um, what is often a very overlooked thermal value in our water system. Wastewater is just usually sort of addressed as a, a water quality management 
problem and people are aware of the temperature in it, um, but leveraging that temperature um, is something that I think these students really help to show as a, as a significant potential. Um, keeping in line with the theme of uh, energy, staying with energy that's in the water system, um, one of the projects that was very synergistic to our work looking at uh, wastewater injury is that we can use heat pumps and district energy systems to capture sewer water. That was part of the previous project. And here at Princeton, we'd been doing a lot of work on geothermal systems. And so this kind of aligned a little bit with that. And um, it's exciting now because as of about six months ago, we've drilled about, uh, from six months ago to about now, we've drilled about 800 wells on Princeton's campus to set up a large new geo exchange system. And so we're, we're transitioning from fossil fuel driven water vapor, otherwise known as steam, right? So we have a steam central heating plant on campus and we're shifting to a geothermal hot water system, um, which was in part informed by the type of COP analysis that I described with the, that the students used in the wastewater project as well as in the air conditioning project. Because when I use heat from the ground and store heat in the ground, I have the ability to have significant increases in the efficiency at which I can deliver that heating, um, in part due to the fact that water is a much more, is a very energy dense medium, much more effective at moving around heat, um, and that I can use the ground and understanding geology um, uh, of the underground surface to increase the performance of those systems. And one of the uh, PhD students did this wonderful analysis of um, the ability potentially to leverage existing um, groundwater, uh, existing, um, fracking well uh, in the Pennsylvania area for district heating to cities, because um, there's all these free, very, very deep wells. So she made this wonderful little um, diagram showing that wells that go down up to one or two kilometers um, have access to heat at the bottom right now when they retire, that could easily provide district heating whoops, um, to cities, particularly in this case near the Pittsburgh area. Um, so this was a really fun exploration demonstrating where um, some of our uh, uh, water more, how would you put it, I guess, fracking isn't necessarily associated with good things about water, um, but the fact that we have drilled many of these uh, million dollar holes in the ground um, and that they will be retiring hopefully due to our energy transition, um, ideally ideas like this might play a role in um, leveraging those valuable resources um, to supply energy again uh, more effectively to our cities. Okay, so uh, uh, transitioning then back to our friend water vapor um, from uh, pumping heat out of the ground with water. Uh, one of the things that we'll be transitioning away from on campus as we move to geothermal um, is the fact that we use cooling towers to reject our heat and again, on Princeton's campus, for example, uh, our energy system is often celebrated. We have a, a cogeneration plant. That means that we make both heat and electricity with our current plant. And we have these cooling towers to reject the heat from our, from our uh, air conditioning system, our centralized chillers and air conditioners that run the chilled water throughout campus. And this is beneficial because these systems then can achieve this uh, evaporative temperature rather than just trying to reject heat into the air. But obviously a geothermal offers, you know, a little bit better temperature, but this is still an efficient solution. Um, but the, the, the challenge that uh, one of the, the, um, ERP, the undergraduate research program, the ERP student, um, Erica Edwards, that came to Princeton, she did a, a fun, uh, campus as a humidity lab experiment, uh, literally jogging around. She was a runner. And so we set up all these sensor modes for her and uh, she ran around literally our, our campus plant because those cooling towers are no small source of water vapor then, right? Because you're, you're evaporating all this water. And a lot of people have looked at the urban heat island. It's a very common topic. You can go to Google Scholar and find many thousands of papers about it. Um, and there is a little subdomain that we are interested in, but that's not as researched as to what is the effect of these huge, massive towers that are blowing humidity into the air. Um, and we did, we're able to demonstrate through this wonderful little um, jogging route <laughs> around the cooling towers um, that we uh, here you can see that with the wind, I think it's most understandable from the, the data displayed on the left here, 
um, uh, that Erica took that the uh, the wind, right? You have a higher relative humidity. Um, you have sort of a background relative humidity of around 80%, which is close to what was measured in the south and east. And then when you go in the windward direction, you see this increase. Um, less so in the data set on the right. But again, um, if we think about uh, psychrometrics, uh, which is a good sort of learning opportunity uh, for Erica, who's now just starting her PhD, I'm very excited to say it, UC Davis. Um, and understanding that when we're at a higher humidity, a small change in the in the grams of humidity in the air, because remember it's the amount, it's the water, the grams of water being blown into the air by these cooling towers. Um, as you increase them, you cross over more relative humidity lines faster over here at high humidity than when you're at lower humidity. So the signal uh, indeed should have been higher in the case where the background humidity was was high. And this is again important. Uh, understanding how psychrometrics can inform climate policy and action in this context for cooling towers, because there are a lot of health feedback issues. Um, there's a lot of problems when you have humidities at, in the urban environment that are above 80%, right? Because you can get all kinds of biofilms and um, New York City kind of famously had a giant Legionella problem from their evaporative cooling towers. Um, and so understanding how these phenomena distribute in the, in the urban environment is is an important um, policy policy issue. Um, and humidity isn't just important at the urban scale, though. Obviously, um, for the people in Arizona, you know, it's always important to point out that it's not the heat that makes you hot; it's the humidity, like what we have in New Jersey, where it's actually hot. No, I'm just kidding. It is actually very 100 to 118 degrees is nothing to uh, bat your eyes at down there in Arizona, but uh, dehumidifying buildings is something that we also do as part of the, the chaos uh, of my lab, looking at cooling and heating for buildings. Um, but one fun side project that's come out of it uh, recently that's related to um, the, the urban water is there's a whole bunch of new technologies around this concept of atmospheric water harvesting that really relate to some of to the work of, of managing humidity in buildings um, and ways in which new efficient sorbent technologies like uh, liquid desiccants and hydrogels and metal organic frameworks are being used uh, to capture water um, out of the air. And we just sort of spun out another small uh, startup that's being run by collaborators in, in the Polytechnic of Torino, um, building some new uh, uh, atmospheric water harvesting technologies. So uh, that was really fast. If anyone wants to interrupt and ask me to expand on anything, I know I probably jumped over some of those projects pretty fast, but uh, we're gonna shift from the overview of energy water um, projects to more the theme of surfaces. I get to do that. I'm going to try my favorite, my favorite Zoom gag. See if it works. Whoops. Uh, I'll have to stop sharing just for a second. All right. So there we go. One of my favorite discoveries of the uh, of the pandemic was that I can use my thermal camera as a webcam. So That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's like super useful for teaching people about um, surfaces and heat. So the first thing that you can see is that the only reason you can see me uh, is because I'm hotter than my window behind me, right? And oh, you can also see that my hands are a little cold in my fingers. So we have some good setback temperatures in the end there. Um, and the fun thing about the infrared spectrum, we were just talking to some students about this, is what you see now, right? When you see me in the visible light, I can, I'm going to do like the camera one, camera two, camera one. All right. So now when you see me, what the camera is translating to you and what, if you saw me in person, uh, would be light reflected off my face. And in this case, I have the lights on in my office if we're outside of the sun, but it's all light that was generated from some external source, right? Like 
our eyes have evolved to see 400 to 700 nanometers because that's the wavelength that the sun emits light in, right? Um, so the light that you see, if I switch to my friend, the thermal camera, now, this is my favorite, there we go, whoops. Now I am the sun. So the sun is 5,000 degrees. So it gets to emit these wavelengths that are 400 to 700 nanometers at, nanometers at their peak and then bounces off everything we see that. Um, but at around 300 Kelvin or like the 35 degrees that I am, I emit around 10 microns wavelength light. Uh, and if I make a clever camera that filters out the visible light, uh, then what you see are the actual photons being emitted from me. And I think uh, having some intuition for this actually goes a long way because what you're seeing now is actually the energy I'm giving to the, to the camera, right? And depending on the camera's temperature, it's shooting photons back on me. And that interaction is happening throughout the built environment and throughout our urban environment. And there's all kinds of um, that, like uh, uh, effects that are at play at all of our surfaces. Um, I don't know if you can see it. Maybe this is a little bit uh, too graphic, but I'm gonna go for it anyway. Uh, if I breathe out, you can see my nostrils actually get cooler because there's evaporative cooling happening in my nose. Um, and we actually found a, a paper in the NIH that uses thermal cameras to track people's breathing rates. Um, so there's all kinds of ways that we can use surface temperatures uh, dynamically. And I could go on and on with my thermal camera on, but I'll give you um, a quick overview of some of the projects that we use um, to do this. Maybe I'll turn the camera back on for questions later. So um, uh, back to share. Hidden surfaces in our environment. Um, there. That's actually the camera I was just using. So, uh, and I gave this one uh, to one of my architecture students who ran all over New York. And we had a fun time as sort of part of that initial climate study, looking at all the different uh, ways in which surfaces um, evolve in their temperatures. Many of them had to do with that first air conditioning study um, I showed looking at how there's, you know, air conditioners create these little nano climates um, around the built environment and how urban climate, urban canyons get heated up because of the way that direct sunlight goes down in a beam and then reflects back diffusely, which creates this radiant trapping phenomenon. So because the sun is a singular source, but when all the surfaces heat up, the heat that they emit, like what you saw on the camera, gets emitted in every direction. So the probability that it escapes back out of this canyon is lower and you get this heating effect and you can take pictures of that. And then there's all these fun little nuanced things that are maybe more relevant to the architecture students, just some kind of small little design decisions that you know architects usually don't play a role in, but are, are relatively critical. Like an architect can help decide whether that vent blows heat on people and their uh, little iced coffees on the streets. Um, so there is a, a, a significant role in understanding um, the heat of these surfaces. And then there's certainly a, a, a fun energy water nexus moment when it rains um, that dramatically shifts the dynamics of the urban surfaces that are constantly being heated up by the sun. Um, so for example, here, um, the average radiant, the mean radiant temperature, average radiant temperature before the sun is up to almost 40 degrees Celsius. Um, and then after one little rain event, we're back down 12 degrees lower. Um, and that change in the radiant temperature around you um, is super important. Um, we use this, this uh, a lot of the work that we've been doing in my lab of late is more circulating around how we define things in terms of thermal comfort, um, because that radiant temperature is equally important to your sensation as the air temperature. Um, it's defined as this quantity called the mean radiant temperature where you take the average temperatures around you that basically what would be the equivalent temperature if all the temperatures were the same temperature that would impart the same radiant heat transfer flux onto you. So all these surfaces that are warm and you are emitting watts of heat and we quantify 
the various temperatures of surfaces and that defines what the mean rate temperature um, would be surrounding you. And as I said, uh, in a typical room, like if, if we take our offices that most of us are in now, uh, roughly let's say 70 degrees Fahrenheit air temperature and roughly 70 degrees wall temperature and calculated the watts of heat transfer on your body, about half of it would be those photons that we saw in the thermal camera. Um, and half of it would be the thing that everybody thinks is controlling whether you're comfortable, which is the temperature that the thermostat's reading and the convection to the air that you're experiencing in your space. Um, and so there's obviously a lot of opportunities to understand how that radiation, right, between surfaces, uh, both indoors and outdoors affect you. Now, um, when I started here at Princeton back in 2013, I was very much into radiant heating and cooling inside buildings. So we were building a lot of prototypes um, to manipulate that because I thought it would be really neat to make people feel hot or cold, not depending on the thermostat temperature, but by shifting the surface temperatures around them. Um, and as part of that, one of the things that came out of that research was developing tools, since thermostats don't measure the surface temperatures around you, building these little tools that do measure the surface temperatures around you. Um, and here you can see some of the mappings that came out. Not only can I map the surfaces around you and some of the funky pavilions that I've built, um, but I can also see people, right? And so as I showed you in the thermal camera, my fingers are a little cold. So if I have sensors that can see the surfaces around me, it means I also have a sensor that can see me. And if it sees me thermally, it sees that my hands are cold, then it can start, I can start to think about interesting ways that those technologies might learn how to respond to the actual state of people rather than the state of just of just building. So um, it evolved as a sort of uh, uh, scanning mean radiant temperature device that we called the little smart sensor um, for fun. Obviously, I love acronyms. Um, this is actually a scan of the office that I'm sitting in right now. Um, and by doing that scan, we could show that through the space, there was actually um, a couple degree difference in what the MRT would be depending on whether I was sitting or standing. Cause I can basically take this geometry and all the surface temperatures that get measured and calculate how that changes the amount of heat that I experience. So, this is for indoors and sort of the next step was when I, when I go outdoors, I can then translate that to how this building, you know, whether the, if this building is in the sun and very, very hot um, at 3 p.m., it's actually affecting the heat experienced by someone across the street or next to the building on the other side of the street very differently. And so these maps um, are important, right, as I, I go outside. So thinking about what it means if I'm outside in the radiant environment um, was really where a whole new opportunity arose um, for this um, um, theme of research, thanks to the UN uh, group and the network that developed um, with researchers at uh, particularly um, Arizona State. Uh, and the best outcome being uh, interacting with Ariana Middle and being able to develop our Smarty Party um, which is a combination of our fun acronym SMART sensor and her fun acronym Marty Cart sensor. Um, her, her, and, and the result being this hybridization of our two fields a bit. So uh, the domain sort of a biometeorology and urban climate outdoors and my interest in indoor thermal comfort and radiant heat transfer and the spatial variations of it. So her system is a very precise sort of uh, meteorological instrument that measures watts of radiant heat transfer in both the short wave and the long wave. And when I say that, um, that means that obviously outside when the sun hits you, you know you feel warm, right? Um, uh, and measuring that component is super important, but in the indoor environment, the short wave component is so small that most building scientists like me that study the indoor environment and radiant heat transfer generally ignore it. Um, and often though, outside, um, people analyzing biometeorology would just look at the sun position and say, okay, the sun is making you hot in the short wave. And so at Ariana, this wonderful uh, collaboration has led to a, a lot of overlapping analysis, looking at these other pieces that sometimes get a little bit less uh, lip service when we're within our own domains of indoors and outdoors. But you know, it's been a growing field, both 
uh, mean radiant temperature related to uh, infrared and long wave outdoors, as well as the short wave component indoors, for example, was just added to the thermal comfort standards for buildings in 2017. Um, and this is something, oh, I didn't put the whole list of people, but um, uh, Dr. Dri Devi, who's now professor at Penn through this project, has now been developing a lot of modeling. And Hongshan Guo, uh, again, who was one of the PhD students, uh, went down to Temple and did this first experiment with Ariana, where we combined the two um, sensors. So here you can see the instruments diagrammed out, where we have these um, uh, kind of uh, net radiometers that measure upward and downward, left and right, front and back, short wave and long wave radiation. And then the smart sensor, which is just measuring the long wave, but doing so at a high resolution. So I get all the different surface temperatures. And in this case, you just get the planar uh, emission fields. And we hybridize them to try and get a sense for what benefits we could add to adding a little more resolution to Marty and adding a little more precision to SMART because we're using these um, inexpensive sensors we can mount on servos and move around and scan um, and we can inform that data um, with the uh, high precision net radiometers that Ariana uses. Um, the initial experiment was like all things uh, done quickly and in between storms when you're outside, uh, in this case in Philly, uh, we then used the data with a, a model that we were able to get from an open LIDAR source. Um, and then, as I said, Dri Aviv developed some modeling tools where we did some ray tracing. And, um, and we combined the simulation with data from both Marty on the left and SMART on the right. So Marty, this data is, again, the overall, the average of all the temperatures that are taking every direction into account very precisely. And you have both in blue um, uh, the total short and long wave component. So the short wave added on top of the long wave, which is the orange line in the bottom. And then you can see the variation in the long wave that SMART gave on the right-hand side, um, sort of uh, subjectively seeing, I think it's, if you can't read, it's from like 23 to 32 degrees, uh, depending on the temperature, right, of the, the ground where the sun was heating up the surfaces versus, um, as we'll come back to later, the importance of trees and sky and providing cooling. So um, the main finding was that confirming what we sort of already knew that there's main, that there is major thermal variation throughout space, that when the weatherman tells you what the temperature is, even if he tells you there's a wind chill or a heat index, um, that the radiant environment is not a uh, constant condition. It is highly spati spatially variable. And it is highly influenced by design decisions we make about our urban environment and where we install um, green and blue infrastructure. Um, the challenge, though, is that we really weren't, we didn't have this, this shortwave component in the resolution of the smart sensor. And so it's hard to calibrate that shortwave component, which is very dynamic because, again, the sun is very uh, in a precise position. Um, but we were able to produce a paper and present at the Urban Climate Conference and um, uh, and published that in the Urban Climate Journal. And it helped um, Hong Shan, uh, Dr. Hongshan Guo uh, in the development of her thesis to uncover, along with one of my other PhD students, Eric Teitelbaum, some major issues with just the definition of mean radiant temperature. So this just shows, I think, how in an interdisciplinary project like UN, we're able to think outside of our standard domains. Um, and so we basically found that the standard way that we've been measuring the the mean radiant temperature inside buildings and how they often uh, use what they use to sort of quickly measure it in outdoor environments, this black globe thermometer, um, has some major errors in how it's used. Um, and Hong Chen also wrote a review paper showing just how the definition of MRT, depending on whether you're talking about a human body, the geometry of a human body, or in the globe thermometer case, this is really only representing a point. So what are the ways in which you're abstracting the heat transfer that someone actually experiences in space once we start to differentiate um, these significant variations in the heat that we experience um, uh, throughout varying surface temperature conditions in cities. Um, so this was a really productive sort of outcome within our team and exposed a lot of other challenges um, that remain on the topic and we've, we've returned to it now. So there is the Smarty Party 2.0 that is on currently ongoing. Um, whoops. Uh, um, 
now with uh, Professor Dorit Aviv at, at Penn, who's using her modeling tools, um, along with, again, Ari uh, Ariane and, and her student Florian, and Dorit's student Meow Meow, and then uh, Coleman Merchant, who's pictured beautifully here with the new sensor he developed, but actually has uh, at the Chaos Lab here um, a shortwave component. So now these are two very preliminary data sources um, that we're looking at where we're excited to be able to combine both the high resolution shortwave and long wave with the MARTI uh, data for the precise mean radiant temperature. Um, and there's some really kind of, I mean, the, the quick takeaways um, um, from this are basically you can see when we're, when we're outside um, in the short wave, there's all there's this the sun is really bright yellow part up here, and then the ground is pretty reflective, but nothing compared to the long wave component, right, which is this uh, really bright piece. But at the end of the day, when you're outside, that the really high watts component remains when you add them up to be larger than the sun. And then the really funky one was when you go to this, people that have been to ASU probably are familiar with the solar canopy shaded area. Um, you can see how the short wave is really um, pretty well shaded, but it creates this uh, huge differentiation across the space, which is uh, pretty interesting um, to consider what, when I then model it with the tools, which we're still working on uh, with Dorit and her team and confirming that we're using the right geometries from some of these things. So a lot of these calculations get very geometric. There was a little image in the last slide. Um, this sort of how do you how do you understand view factors like how big a surface is and how many and what how its temperature generates a flux um, to to various surfaces of a person involves a lot of different modeling potential uh, options for for considering the human body. And so, um, in the little time I have left, I'm just going to um, uh, jump. To then the, the last thing that I would argue for um, in terms of thinking about these some of these more counterintuitive um, aspects that obviously are not sort of common knowledge how variable the outdoor environment is because we're constantly told every morning what the temperature is by Google or your weatherman or your Alexa um, and it's just the air temperature and so um, we've tried our best to build crazy demonstrations so um, this was a relatively successful prototype cooling pavilion that we built in Singapore. Um, it had one sort of fun uh, and innovative physics trick, which if you look first on the left to see how much fun we have, I guess that's the most important thing. I always have fun doing research. Um, but on the right, also fun, is uh, Eric Teitelbaum. And if you look in the visible spectrum, you can see his face on the right-hand side. And then if you look through the thermal camera on the, you see that now you only see them on the left-hand side, but you can't in the visible spectrum. And this is just to help to demonstrate that again, in these two different spectrums, if I'm trying to cool you by using cold radiant surfaces, I can build windows for those surfaces. And the problem with trying to cool you with cold radiant surfaces is that in Singapore, those cold radiant surfaces would get covered with condensation almost immediately. Um, and so the innovative thing was to build these panels and our kind of diagram down here with this blue surface, which is this really fancy thing we call the photonic membrane. You also could call it a garbage bag <laughs> um, because it's just polyethylene. So it turns out polyethylene is a nice window for a rain heat transfer. It turns out polyethylene is also the same thing we use in buildings as a water vapor barrier in walls. So this nice water vapor barrier um, prevents condensation um, from occurring on the surface of our cold panels, allows us to make them much colder than you could ever make any standard radiant cooling panel, like the ones above my head in my office. If I made these as cold as we made those in, in the New Jersey summer here, I would get rained on my office, which is not fun. Um, so we were able to make, at the end of the day, 90 degrees and 80% humidity feel in terms of the number of watts that my friend Adam Rizanek is enjoying here in the bottom picture. The number of watts that are being removed from his body uh, by these panels around him is equivalent to standing in a sort of standard 75 degree space. So there's some fun, you know, everybody's like, really? Yeah, really. But um, there's a lot of things about how hot you were before you came in, you know, uh, and 
the transient state. But you know, if you came out of the office building and walked in here, you really, you really couldn't tell a difference. Um, and this has been very successful um, in the media, in part because the other thing it does is does not tie fresh air delivery to the air conditioning system. So there are no walls needed boxing us into an indoor space where we're all breathing the same air, which um, after COVID, I think we all realize is one of the bigger driving forces for transmission rates. It's just whether people are inside with each other um, versus not. Uh, we've also tried to do this more on the architectural side. So that was the more recent project. Um, Dri Aviv uh, and I curated this pavilion for an architectural Biennale exhibition where we made one side of the hallway feel hot and the other side feel cold, just using strategic reflecting of these radiant components um, and um, working with our my now uh, researcher in the chaos lab, Kip Bradford, who built this fancy heat pump system to move heat from one side of the hallway to the other without heating up or cooling down the air very much. Um, and we also uh, did this through a, a modeling experiment in at the NYU exhibition of collapse, crisis, climate, and culture. And so this was to a sort of broader audience of urban planners and New York City um, um, policymakers. And what we built, which, you know, I can't ever just build a simple model. I could have just built this model of the city, which was fun to make because in, in this case, I used the images that, uh, that Laura Salazar, the master student, had gotten. And then I rode my bike throughout the city taking more thermal images. And then we made a sort of 3D model from the images of the heat. This is a little cross section of between Central Park and the Hudson River. Um, but I also built the Trump Tower because I thought that would be fun. And on the Trump, I made the Trump Tower very hot because um, uh, the, the, the heat would heat up um, a building like this. And this is sort of an example of an urban cannon. So we put some little heating pads and made it hot. And I also hid a little thermal camera in the heating pad. So you can see in the bottom left, you could stick your hand in between the two buildings and we made it about 40 to 50 degrees. So it'd be about what a building would heat up to uh, in the sun when the sun's coming to the canyon. And you can see how blue um, Eric Teitelbaum's hand looks in the image between the two hot buildings. So his hand is being heated up by the building because it's colder. And then we built these little thermal electric trees to try and sort of demonstrate the power of trees to maintain temperatures that are cooler by through evaporation in their pores. Um, and so if I put my face right here, like above the tree temperatures, you can see the fact that the trees maintain a cooler temperature than your body temperature. And so that exchange then is a net negative flow. And that's why Central Park feels better than the main city. Although you can show that Central Park is on the order of five degrees, often cooler in air temperature you'd be surprised how hard it is for you to distinguish five degrees change in air temperature. The real difference is that the mean radiant temperature between these buildings is about 30 degrees warmer than the mean radiant temperature experienced in a park with green surfaces. So that's sort of the uh, perfect segue to next week. So one of the projects that I just started and then kind of got slowed down, we haven't been able to follow up on it, um, is looking at green surfaces with Chris Swan um, at University of Maryland, Baltimore. So I, I gave him a thermal camera at our last in-person meeting of UN, and then he took it down and we tried to do some analysis. We're looking at how we can quantify how much cooling different types of plants um, give and understand better the co-benefits um, of, of different species, like by being more specific in what we choose. Um, and next week, uh, I think Daryl is probably, he has lots more to say about how plants affect this. And I've had some wonderful conversations with him um, and his team as well, talking about how plants are one of the most important things um, that drive all of the radiant cooling of surfaces that I'm so interested in, in modeling and measuring. Um, and I think people like uh, Daryl and Chris have some, and, and many others have great ideas of how to do that in practice, understanding ecology and, and planting systems. So um, I will leave it with that. And hopefully everybody comes to see Daryl next week. I did Sarah's job for her of announcing next week's presentation. <laughs> yes, thank you. Love it. It's great. Good, good segue. Me, uh, oh, actually, I, 
I have a last slide with my email address on it. Um, but you can find me on the UN website. It's not hard. Yeah, yeah. You, you appear on Google as well, so. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I, I should go put out some of those images, but I have no no shame, so I don't think uh, Nice. Well, <laughs> I think uh, for the next UN meeting, you're going to have to develop some type of, like, next series of Marvel super oh yeah human, like I didn't even mention the thermal Avengers yes exactly yeah yeah for sure I think I think there's some legs there so <laughs> exactly I'm so excited to get back together hopefully in person when things calm down uh, yep yep that is the intention so thanks everyone for your time uh we're at the top of the hour here so I'll be sure to send out the link to this once I get it posted and hope to see y'all next week same day same time Thank awesome. you. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day. Bye, Bye all.